Um, but today we have the pleasure of welcoming our own Sabetta Matsumoto. Um, so I'm feeling like this is being, I know it's at the Institute, but Penn's hosting it because I'm talking. And so um, uh, we've heard from Sabetta before and she has uh, moved into a different area um, which combines all her deep interests in uh, uh, math and art and physics. And uh, I'm excited to hear what she has to say. So we're going to record this. Is that okay, Sabetta? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, oh, it is being recorded. Okay. So why don't you take it away? All right. Thank you so much, Randy. Um, it's a pleasure to be back. I remember uh, this seminar being one of the best seminars that um, I went to as a graduate student. Uh, I don't know what that has to say about uh, my grad school experience, but I really enjoyed these seminars a lot. Um, just a question, I'm sharing screen. Are you all seeing the Zoom stuff on top of my screen or not? No, nope. no, we just see the okay. dragon. Okay, cool. Um, so I guess I will be telling you a bit about work that's been going on in my group for the past uh, several years. Um, we are trying to look at uh, knitting and textiles from kind of two points of view, from the point of view of um, a, a mathematical question and uh, from the point of view of a sort of geometric physics-y question. Um, so I know this is a topology seminar, so I'll probably try to focus a little bit more on the former uh, question, trying to come up with something of uh, a grammar for uh, knitting, which I guess just so I'll, I'll walk you through what knitting means, but this doesn't apply to weaving or crochet or other textiles. Um, I'll just say that up front. Um, before I get started, I do want to point out the um, wonderful members of my group uh, who contributed to this, uh, this pair of stories, although they are now mostly no longer part of the group. Um, I guess you all, well, most of you I'm sure know Shashank Markande, um, who has now joined the uh, soft matter theory group at Penn. Uh, and he's the, the main student who worked on the not theory project. Um, so that'll be the, the first vignette. And then Mike Dimitriev, uh, who is now at UMass Amherst in the uh, polymer science department, was the postdoc in charge of simulations. And he worked really closely with Krishna Singhal, who is a PhD student in, uh, who's, who's still in my group. Um, and she's the experimental student who is working on sort of imaging and the mechanics of of textiles. Um, so as I talk, uh, feel free to unmute yourself and interrupt with any questions you have, put them in chat. Um, just feel free to stop me um, at any point if you want clarification or you want to talk in more detail about any anything that I mentioned, um, or just want to tell me that I'm totally wrong, because it's probably true for some of these things. Um, so I guess our group works a little bit on the point of view that knitting is coding. Um, and from a historical point of view, this isn't, uh, this is a way that many people have viewed textiles. What you see here is an image of the Jacquard loom. Um, this is from the early 1800s, and it is the first binary technology, or first digital technology that, that humans invented at a large scale. Um, 
what is going on here is that um, this is for weaving. So weaving is basically a process of taking uh, yarn and going sort of over, under, over, under, over, under with another piece of yarn. Um, and they do that at a large scale and that creates the full textile. Um, what the Jacquard loom does that's a little bit different is that every crossing in your textile becomes individually addressable. So instead of having it always be over, under, over, under, or have some fixed pattern that gets repeated throughout the entire textile, you can use punch cards to basically say, okay, it's gonna be an over, so that's a one and under is a zero. And so you can basically create um, very intricate tapestries. So there's a picture here that's basically a, a woman's face that's being woven um, using a modern version of a jacquard loom. So we're interested in what it is about knitting that's a bit different. So first off, knitting uh, has more than just over-unders. Uh, the words here um, are pretty complicated. If you look at the picture on the right, there's all these ASCII symbols. So each ASCII symbol encodes for a different manipulation of your needles. And something that's really useful to point out in knitting that's not true of weaving and other textiles is that words aren't one bit long there. You can have words that extend over larger regions. So um, there's words that cover like one by two or two by four sort of rectangular blocks. Um, so we'll talk a bit about how this can form a grammar. Um, and on the other side, each of these manipulations of yarn encodes uh, different elastic properties into the material. So based on how you change each of these sort of topological manipulations, you get um, a different elastic response. Uh, so here is just a close-up of what knitting is. So imagine you have two needles, so a left needle and a right needle, and each of them has a whole bunch of loops on them. Um, and from one loop, a loop on the left needle, you stick your right needle into that, then you wrap the free yarn around that, and you basically have, you pull a new loop through the loop on your left needle and move it to your right needle. And this is uh, something that's uh, basically the process of pulling loops through loops. So these are, these are slip knots. So without the needles in there, the whole thing would unravel. Um, another thing that's worth pointing out that makes this sort of fundamentally different than weaving is that, um, knitting is a process that doesn't require any ends of yarn. Um, so you could imagine having a really, really, really large um, loop of yarn, just a, a, an S1 of yarn. You pick it up in the middle and every manipulation here is local to the yarn surrounding what you're doing. So you don't need to rely on an end that's infinitely far away or anything else. Everything is purely local. Um, so if we want to look at this a bit more closely, um, what we have is um, basically a loop that's been pulled through a loop. And it just occurred to me that I packed the, the actual yarn sample, the cloth samples that I usually hold up um, to camera to explain this stuff to you. Um, so since we're, moving back to Atlanta tomorrow. I unfortunately don't have them. I could probably run and grab them pretty quickly, but um, I guess I'll just sort of in words explain what I was going to say. So for knitting, um, pulling a loop through the, another loop is the fundamental thing you can do. 
And when you pull a loop from the back of the fabric through to the front of the fabric, that's called a knit stitch. So K is the blue one. And then if I pull a loop from the front of the fabric through to the back, that's a purl stitch. And I can make a fabric that's entirely made out of these stitches. Um, so this would be called stockinette um, when it's all knits. And pearl, uh, reverse stockinette is just the back side of that fabric. So basically, a knit is a 180 degree rotation of a pearl. Um, so fundamentally, these two fabrics are the same thing. But it's um, interesting to note that when you make different patterns just using knits and pearls, you have really strikingly different mechanical properties. So the fabric I just showed you, stockinette, um, to be honest, I don't even need to hold up a sample in front of you because all of you are, I'm sure, wearing something made out of this. If it's, it's usually called jersey. If, it, um, if it's machine produced, it's stockinette when it's hand knit. I'm mostly a hand knitter, so I'm gonna use that terminology. Um, I know a lot of other people, uh, Randy's group, jean um, they do uh, machine knitting, so they are likely to refer to things in a slightly different language than I do, although I think everything I'm going to say loosely applies to what they're working on as well. Um, and I'll point out the differences as we come to them. But so stockinette is is t-shirt material. It's the same, it's a sort of material, it's t-shirts, socks, underwear. It's just the, the really common anytime you're wearing something stretchy, like my dress is made out of it. Um, you know, things like that uh, are going to be made out of stockinette. These other three samples I have are different ways of, of pairing them together. So garter stitch is where I have alternating rows of knits and pearls. So I get kind of this, like, if I look sideways, I'd have a little bit of a, a zigzaggy uh, pattern going up and down. So that's really stretchy vertically, but and is pretty stretchy horizontally. Um, I have ribbing where I have uh, columns that are alternating knits and pearls. And this is just really, really, really stretchy. This is completely an accordion type thing. So the picture I'm showing you here that says like one by one ribbing is virtually identical to the picture that says stockinette. And that's because all of the stitches that are pearl stitches are actually um, forming kind of these pleats that are on the back of the fabric. Um, and then seed stitch is the um, uh, checkerboard lattice of all of these. Um, and this is sort of an intermediate stretchiness. And I should point out that um, that stockinette is actually the stiffest of all of these. This is um, somewhat surprisingly, I guess, is, is the stiffest. Um, and it turns out that each of these other fabrics have been used for uh, many centuries, if not millennia, because they have these, prop these different uh, mechanical properties. So ribbing is used places like cuffs or collars. So places where I need my wrist, like the fabric around my wrist to stretch a lot so it can fit my entire hand through, but I don't need like a huge baggy cuff. I want it to be uh, pretty, snug to the shape of my wrist afterwards. So ribbing is something that's used there. Um, garter is actually named because of garter belts and stockinette is named because of stockings. So these have um, elasticities in different directions. Um, so garter belts, you do have more of a vertical pull, but you want it to be a little bit stiff so it doesn't fall down your leg. So all of these are really um, are really created for their mechanical properties. Um, so before we get into the mechanical properties, I know we want to, well, I want to talk about the topological properties. So this is um, a fundamental, well, this is a fundamental translational domain of a knit stitch. Um, 
And so what I'm going to show you is it, it seems like it matters how I connect these up. So I'm going to show you two animations that look like they're going to give me different structures. Um, so first, I'm going to take this same object and I'm going to um, I'm going to wrap the top and the bottom of it sort of around to the front and the left and the right around to the back. So first the left and the right are going to sort of extend so you can see what's going on. And now the top and the bottom are going to wrap around in front of that. And then the left and the right are going to continue to wrap around behind that. And so this looks like an unknot. Um, it looks like I've got sort of two elephant ears that I can sort of pick up, untwist, and this will give me an unknot. If instead I take the same object and now I'm going to wrap the left and the right around behind the structure. So here you can see that, that the left and the right, these sort of elephant ears are gonna pass behind this loop and then those are gonna continue and wrap around behind everything else. Now this object looks like the connect sum of a left-handed trefoil and a right-handed trefoil. Um, but I think we've forgotten when I sort of glue these things up on their own that the manifold we're looking at isn't just T2, it's, it's T2 cross I. So what we wanna do is look at what these knots would look like in T2 cross I. So this is how this knot would actually wrap around um, the, if, if you imagine this is my T2 cross I with the um, yellow and green boundary components here. Um, this, is, this is how the knot would actually be entangled around them. So instead of studying these in T2 cross I um, like this, instead of treating T2 cross I as the manifold we want to study, what we really want to do is study these things in S3. So I can construct T2 cross I by removing a hop link from S3. So if I look at the complement um, of the hop link in S3, the manifold I'm left over um, with is homeomorphic to T2 cross I. So let's take that and try to understand how our knots behave there. Um, so I'm going to sort of walk you through an animation. Well, not really an animation, but a, a series of still images of how we might do that. <clears throat> so we start with um, uh, our, our knot. So now this is in the sort of boundary identified version of T2 cross I, where we imagine that the, the um, green side and the green side are glued together and the red side and the red side are glued together. And then all of the black components in the corners are a single component. Um, so imagine I take this and so now I'm gonna kind of do a kind of image where I've got my T2 cross I in S3. So now I'm gonna try to glue this up in a way that's consistent with my choice of, um, of, of T2 cross I. So I start out with um, my, my knit in here. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna wrap the, the green sides around and, and glue them so that they um, link with the green component of my hop link. So that's going to create this structure here. And I'm gonna do the same thing with the red sides. So I'm gonna sort of first just pull this up so you can see that I'm really gonna wrap it around that, um, the red component of the hop link. And I end up with this. So this is great because you can now see that the, um, that those sort of boundary uh, surfaces in that original version of T2 cross I are really just annuluses um, in, in S3. And there is um, a single uh, black line that joins those two annuli. Um, and so I can put this into 
more standard um, a planar projection, and we can now use this to study it. So what I've basically done is I've got the inside of my of the dashed lines is my original knot, and then outside of that is sort of a gadget that tells me that actually this is um, a link that is in T2 cross I, but now I'm studying it in terms of S3, so I can use Snappy and all sorts of things like that. So we wanted to understand uh, what can be knit. Um, so what, what things can I put inside this black dashed domain? Um, and what will those, um, <clears throat> what, what is possible for knitting? Um, <clears throat> so uh, this is what uh, Shashank spent um, about, about 50% of his PhD thinking about these sorts of questions. Um, so he had noticed when he was playing around with basically books, libraries of different types of stitches, had noticed that um, all, of, all of the stitches that existed had the property that they are ribbon. So ribbon knots are basically what happens when you take your knot um, and then uh, you uh, basically create a disk in the space with the knot as its boundary. And you can only have certain types of singularities in it, which are called ribbon singularities, um, which are basically where the purple passes through the green or the pink passes or the blue passes through the pink. So you can only have a full length strip of your, um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, of your, sorry, a full width strip of your knot that passes through any uh, other portion of that disk. Um, so basically you can't have sort of these sort of X style crossings. That's not allowed. Um, so, so Shashank was, had noticed that, that all of these were ribbon knots. So uh, we conjecture that all knittable stitches must be ribbon knots um, and that we have uh, proven. And then the converse would be, are all ribbon knots knittable stitches? Um, and that I can tell you the answer is no, um, but that's, um, I mean, you can just sort of find counterexamples easily for that. Um, so, so one day Shoshank texted me this picture. So he had, he was playing around with different types of, of ribbon knots and was thinking, well, maybe this is a counterexample that all ribbon knots are knittable. Um, and I guess I sort of looked at it and I was like, well, maybe, maybe it's knittable. I feel like there should be a way of doing this. It's, it's definitely not machine knittable, but maybe I can do it with my hands. Um, <clears throat> so I texted him back and was like, okay, well, um, bring some, uh, bring some yarn and uh, needles to group meeting on Monday and, and we'll try to figure it out. So he did. And it turns out that this, stitch he proposed is a real stitch. So it's the, there's six of them here. They're the ones that have the little kind of like side swirl dollops on them. Um, he's called it the cow hitch stitch um, because it's reminiscent of a cow hitch knot. Um, <clears throat> and this is a new stitch. This is a stitch that doesn't exist in any of the literature that I've ever seen from the knitting community. Um, it's a, it's maybe because it doesn't super have a structural property. It basically behaves the same way a regular stitch does. It just has this little kind of like dollopy swoosh on the side. Um, but it's, the idea was that he was able to use the mathematics of uh, knitted stitches to come up with 
an idea or a, a new stitch. Um, so this is the, the language of math giving back to the knitting community. And this is, I think, something similar. Um, if any of you are jugglers out there, um, the same sort of thing happened in juggling where people, um, I guess several mathematicians who were also jugglers had independently come up with a notation for juggling. And because of the notation, they found pattern, juggling patterns that were consistent with the notation that hadn't been taught in the, the sort of juggling craft being uh, passed down uh, historically. So I'm gonna show you um, the basic construction uh, for the grammar of, of knitting. So we call uh, the basic unit of our grammar a swatch. Um, and so the swatch, this is in T2 cross I here, but we can do that same technique to put it into S3. Um, so we have here, um, we've got N longitudes that are so non-contractible loops and um, M contractible loops. So what I've done here is I've sort of slid one past where I've drawn my boundaries in um, and colored a little portion in gray. So everything in gray, I'm gonna glue down and not allow us to do anything until the very end. And what I can do now here is I can do any Rittemeister move. I can do any um, planar isotopy. I can do anything I want that doesn't involve me um, cutting and re-gluing these yarns, the, the stitches together. Um, so the example I show has um, some Rittemeister one moves. So uh, basically looping and unlooping things, Rittemeister two moves where two, uh, two se segments of yarn sort of can pass over each other either with one in front or the other in front or Rittemeister three moves where you have three uh, pieces of yarn and you can slide one of them past the crossing made by the other two. So we can do whatever we want from these in any combination. Um, and then the last thing we do is we need to connect the longitudes to the top um, the, the top contractible loops in gray. And we're gonna do that using band surgery. So here the idea for band surgery is, I'm gonna just use this example on the left to walk you through what band surgery means. Um, so imagine I have these two knots here and I'm gonna take um, little rectangles um, uh, where two op opposite sides of the rectangles are parts of the knot and then the other two sides aren't. And the process of band surgery basically just swaps which pair of edges on the, on the rectangle are edges in the knot. Um, so this is <clears throat> what the result of that band surgery would look like. So they can be between two knots or on the same knot. Um, and so we're gonna do that on our swatch. And so this is the, this is what we get. Um, the one thing I'm gonna point out here is that when, <clears throat> when we write down our swatch, we've chosen a frame on our, um, on our T2 cross I, uh, we have decided that the um, longitude is going to be along the, the sort of course direction. So the, the knit next to knit next to knit, like the loops on the, the needles. And then um, the meridian is going to be the sort of direction of the rows. Um, and so this is, this is a framing that comes out of this choice of what a swatch is, um, where we are choosing this as the sort of canonical swatch framing. Um, you could imagine putting a different framing on it, but then you would have to be consistent with 
how you, um, I guess the, what the homology group of the new meridians are and where you glue things down and things like that. It, you can make it consistent, but it's kind of messy. So we were just going to stick to doing it this way. Um, the thing about swatches that's really nice um, is that we can not just look at individual stitches, which are one loop going into one loop. We can look at many loops going into many other loops, which is a thing that happens in knitting that's not something that necessarily happens in, um, in some of the other uh, languages, like uh, structurally, uh, I guess, languages that would come out of, um, of textiles or grammars that would come out of textiles. Um, and so the idea for swatches, I guess I don't have a slide for this, but the idea that Shashank has been currently working on, um, or I guess is, I guess is just finished up on and presented at March meeting um, about is ways of turning uh, swatches into a grammar. So there's basically a way of doing, um, I guess, surgery on the three manifold complements of the um, the links in T2 crop, or sorry, in S3, where you basically either cut along the longitude or cut along the meridian and glue multiple uh, knots together that way. Um, and this is basically a process in the swatch that is akin to taking, finding um, all sorts of little mini swatch bricks and assembling them into a larger composite swatch. Um, so this gives you a way to start um, enumerating how many possible knitted structures there are. Um, so I guess with the last little bit of time I've got, um, I did want to just briefly tell you about um, the emergent elasticity in these two, since this is a thing that is based on topology, but in, in a sense, it's topology that's quite informed by local geometry as well. Um, so this is uh, a video of Krishma making one of our samples. So this is uh, our old knitting machine. We have since gotten a, a large industrial knitting machines that will do all of this for her, um, but for our first our first paper, we had um, we just had this this uh, seventy style manual knitting machine, and what Krishma did was um, she did stress strain experiments on it where um, this one doesn't have pins in it, but she basically put a lattice of pins in and was able to use those to to track the nonlinear strain um, as this develops. And Mike uh, worked on simulations to do the same, same sort of thing. So what Mike's simulations looked at were um, basically splitting up the stitch into different regions. So there are what are called crossover regions, so places where two uh, pieces of yarn wrap around each other and sort of directly interact with one another uh, non-locally. And then there are connecting regions, so regions that join those two together. Um, and so what his simulations uh, basically did put them in a, a periodic boundary conditions and said that the total length of the yarn in a stitch has to be fixed. Um, so this is something we measured. Um, and then basically treated them like elastica. So this is the, the minimal possible model you could imagine for a, um, for a knit uh, or for any type of, of material. So there is some energy for bending and some energy for twisting. Um, here we assume that the twisting energy is zero since it is 
much, much easier to twist yarn um, that has been spun than it is to bend it. Although both of them are extremely, they have very low moduli compared with um, an elastic solid of the same radius. Um, and we measure, we experimentally measured the, um, the bending modulus for, for the yarn samples we used. Um, and then uh, basically down uh, the backbone of the yarn, uh, the different pieces. So this is just highlighting the crossover regions right now. So the places where we have direct yarn yarn interactions. Um, so the, there's a, a, a Feeney spring that's put um, along these two basically measure the interaction. We, we did our best to measure the um, functional form of this. So basically trying to find the right hardcore boundary cutoff. Um, but it's, this is the, the one part of the measurements that we couldn't directly translate over into simulations very easily other than kind of the, the sort of order of magnitude of what the interaction is. Um, and then what Mike did was he decided that um, instead of the sort of standard bead spring model that a lot of physicists tend to use, we wanted to look at um, Bezier curves. Um, and basically these are expanding uh, continuous curves into a polynomial basis. And the idea is that there are control points that tell you something about the local geometry of the curve. So K0 and K3 are the control points that tell you where the curve starts and ends. And then the vector connecting K0 to K1 is the tangent vector at K0. And the vector connecting K2 to K3 is the tangent vector at K3. And then you can have higher order Bezier curves or that have more control points that would control curvature and, and other moments. Um, in this expansion. Um, and so Mike took um, the crossover regions and connecting regions, each as their own Bezier curves, and looked at making sure that they, the control points on them guarantee that they have the same uh, start and end, the same tangent vectors. Um, turns out that the for the solutions to converge, we didn't need to super worry about them having the same um, curvature, although we ran samples both ways and it took significantly longer and didn't produce uh, a noticeable difference in, in the elastic module. So mostly we just went with the, the fifth order Bezier curves. And so this is what the minimal energy configurations look like for each of these. These to the eye look very similar to uh, the nits I showed at the beginning. Um, if you sort of examine them next to um, next to uh, the photographs. And Mike also went through and did the same uh, experiments on these on these new uh, textiles. So he did the same uniaxial stress strain experiments and measured the, um, the elastic response. So these are the results we get for the stress strain curve. So this is quite a lot to take in at once. I'm gonna try to break it down. So on the right of the y-axis here, we are looking at the response in the extraction to a force in the extraction. And to the left of the y-axis, we're looking at the response in the y-direction to a force in the extraction. Each of the lines in here is color-coded based on which fabric sample it comes from, whether it's stockinet, garter, uh, rib, or seed. Um, and the curves here are um, open symbols, are the simulation, closed symbols are the experiment, and both of them 
are fitted to um, a self-consistent um, nonlinear constitutive relation that I will talk about um, in a minute. Uh, so what we can see is that almost all of the simulations match the experimental data very well with the exception of seed. Um, seed, we did have a lot of problems with it converging because there are so many, per, for, for each unit cell, there's a lot of places where yarn interacts with yarn. So we were finding that it would very easily get trapped in different local minima. Um, so there is quite a bit of a discrepancy coming from that. Um, and then this is the response um, for a force in the y direction. Uh, so I guess I should point out here uh, before I change slides that stockinette is the stiffest. Uh, so looking at the, the slope of the stress strain curve is going to tell you approximately what the stiffness is. And rib is by far the softest. Um, and with our sort of two regimes here, there's a, a linear regime, which is the regime we're, we're used to dealing with fabrics in, um, where, you know, sort of the amount of stretchiness you need to pull a t-shirt over your head, that kind of level, or, you know, it can accommodate for your stomach after you've eaten um, too big of a meal for dinner. Um, that kind of regime is pretty, pretty much this linear regime. And then the nonlinear regime is where you have yarn pulling against yarn and you're just probing the, um, the hardcore interaction of yarn on yarn. Um, in the Y direction, we find again, stockinette is the stiffest and then both garter and seed are, are pretty much equivalently soft. Um, and we wanted to understand what it is of, about these, um, but it is about these sort of topological changes, just changing from knits to pearls, that um, causes this elastic response. And basically, um, we looked at this from the point of view of um, sort of crossing changes. So, if I have a stockinette, I've sort of pulled yarn from the back to the front. Um, and then I'm going to have cert certain crossings that are on top and certain crossings that are underneath. And if I have a pearl, I'm going to have pulled yarn from the front to the back. So basically all of those crossings have switched. So when I have two pieces of yarn that are, or sorry, two stitches next to each other that are both knits or both pearls, they have to be joined by um, a yarn segment that has even symmetry. Um, so this is the sort of violet U-shaped region. Um, and when we pull on this, we're basically going to be taking the, the projected length lambda naught and increasing it to some length lambda naught plus a delta lambda um, while keeping the total length of that segment fixed. Um, and so in, in an Elastica model, this basically says that we have, this is 180 times the bulk of the bending modulus divided by some yarn constants. Um, so I guess I, I'll get to those in a minute, but either they're a length scale or they're order one. Um, when we have a knit joined to a pearl, these have to be joined together by an odd shaped segment. Um, so here, this is sort of the S shaped V, oh, sorry, S shaped um, violet curve. Uh, and again, we're looking at the projected length lambda naught as we increase it to some other length lambda. Um, and for this one, um, there's some bending deformation that happens, um, but primarily there is a soft mode that allows this to, this curve to rotate so that angle phi can basically decrease without causing much deflection in the yarn. And so the Elastica model for this is it's 1 12th B divided by the same constants 
as before plus one times something that's proportional to cosine five, or sorry, cotangent phi. So basically the order of these, uh, the even shaped region is about 15 times stiffer. Um, and then we've got this, uh, this other term. So cotangent phi kind of makes sense. So if it's perfectly straight, it costs zero energy to, to wiggle back and forth um, in this linear regime. But if it's perfectly horizontal, it's going to take infinite amount of energy to stretch because this yarn is inexpensive. Um, and so the this is this is what we get. So when it is mostly in this sort of vertical to about uh, 45 degrees, we're going to have, this is going to be order one. So we're not going to have additional, um, much additional stiffness coming from this. Um, and so we can look at our stitches, um, the, the, on the four basic fabrics and look at how these symmetries affect them. So stockinette is, even when we're looking at it stitch by stitch. And it's also even when we look at it row by row. So this kind of makes sense why it's going to be the stiffest. Um, garter is even when you look at it stitch by stitch, but it's odd when you look at it row by row. And so it is pretty soft in that direction. Um, rib is odd when you look at it stitch by stitch. Um, and you'll also notice that the, um, that angle phi that's sort of telling you how vertical it is, um, it is incredibly vertical here. Um, so it's almost pi over two. Um, and then it, it is even symmetry when we look at it row by row. Um, stock, uh, sorry, uh, seed stitch is odd symmetry when you look at both, um, but compared with rib um, in the in the x direction in the in the stitch by stitch direction you'll notice that the um, that that phi is approximately uh, pi over four so this is going to be quite a bit stiffer at least a factor of two if not more stiffer than the rib uh, just based on this like hand wavy elastica model um, and so we also wanted to the last thing I'll tell you very briefly is the idea of trying to come up with a constitutive model for these. Um, so this is based on the idea that um, we can get out a length scale. So we call it basically bending length, um, depending on what, what external force is applied to each of the samples. So if you have no force on your sample, you've got a really large bending length that's sort of pretty evenly distributed across the yarn. So it's of order the stitch size. As you pull really tightly on it, the bending length decreases until it's of order the yarn size. Um, and so these are the sort of two regimes we, we noticed in the um, elastic, in, in, the, in the stress strain experiments. Um, and so we can come up with a model that kind of looks at this. So if we have, this is our simplified Elastica model. So we've got um, just um, curvature squared for the energy and a, a Lagrange multiplier to maintain the length, the length constraint. Um, and we look at these two and we're able to pull out a length scale from the bending and the tension. Um, and in the elastica limit, we can look at what happens if we have um, some yarn of length L with tangent vectors T0 and T1 at some length, some sort of fixed length R. And then you want to look at how much energy it costs you to go from R to R plus delta R. And so that energy scales like um, one over one minus R over L. So R is the length of the length between the endpoints and L is the length of the total piece of yarn. 
Um, and so we can add these together. Um, basically the stress strain model coming from that is going to give us the high tension uh, region and then the low tension region is this linear regime. So currently we've just fit to what these elastic constants are and in the future we're going to try to unpick from the microscopics of the problem um, how we can um, basically work out what these are from the point of view of both uh, the local stitch topology and the measured parameters of the yarn. Um, and this is something we can put into um, just any old uh, finite element model. Um, and so this is uh, both the, the model and the equivalent, uh, the equivalent experiment shown on top of each other. Um, and the thing that we also want to do next is going to be to look at what topological defects do to these. So if we imagine that knits are a crystalline material, what happens when you break that crystalline order? Um, and so this is something that's built into how you uh, create knits. Um, you can have increases and decreases, which are basically like dislocations. And you can have um, what are called short rows, which act like disclinations. So dislocations are basically adding in extra rows and disclinations are places where the ori orientational order changes. Um, and so we'd like to study how these work both in the knot theory picture and elastically. Um, and then we also want to uh, look at this as a way of understanding both in-plane and out-of-plane deformations. So here we've definitely violated the um, crystalline order in both the, the three-dimensional bunny head and the two-dimensional uh, scarf. So we'd like to see how defects sort of play a part in, um, in creating this, this type of uh, geometric deformation. Um, so sorry, I think I've run a teeny bit over time, but thank you so much for your attention. Um, and I'd be more than happy to take any questions that you have. Nicely done. That was really nice, Savannah. I'm going to start by asking a question. Okay. I, it, it's ignorance. The, when you show me the disclinations, it was just two slides back. Mm -hmm. um, can you actually knit a disclination or do you have to actually then go back and, and hook it back together? No, you knit it. This is, um, okay, so. Cause I is, see, I see what looks like, like, like extra stitching on the, on the, I think that's a knee, right? Or, or, some, uh, it's, oh, it's, it's the, still the sock. sock. Yeah. There, both of so those, those are heel patterns for socks. Um, okay. So it looks like there's extra stitches. Actually, this is done as a single process. So what short rows are is like, you, so you have your yarn on your needles um, and then you basically don't knit the entire row. You sort of knit part way through and go like back and forth um, through that. I and see. then at the end, you just knit everything together. Um, so basically, you're sort of creating this place where you're effectively sort of rotating the what the direction up is because you've sort of started it one way and then you're tricking it into thinking you're always going this way but actually you're bending it with respect to where um, you started. So you end up with basically the points at the end of that would be what I would mostly consider the disclinations but um, this one this was definitely made on a machine. So I think they've done something. There's, there's sort of special attachments to machines that do these, what are called heel gussets. Um, so you're getting a, a much stronger set of those, like, um, like the, the, that V shape is kind of accentuated there where you wouldn't really see so much of it if it was hand knit. I understand. 
And and then a, a more a broader question. So um, when we when we think about machine knitting things, we think um, there's the two directions. There's the knitting direction, and there's the direction mm -hmm. that the needle goes back and forth. Mm -hmm. And I never remember which is which. One is coarse, and one is weft. But I never remember yeah, which is which. Yeah, that's coarse, and then this is whale. Oh, whale. This is whale, and this is coarse. Okay, so. Um, all the things you do, can you translate them if you want to rotate it 90 degrees? So you make these, I saw those beautiful braided braided things, right? Mm -hmm. the, the braids. And so that was a 3D geometry. And that must have been built with respect to a particular course or, or whale direction. Mm -hmm. Can, you, can yes. you decide to, can you take all these rules and rotate them 90 degrees and then reconstruct everything? to go along the whale direction when it used to go along the course direction? Or um, so are you asking about word, warp knitting? I'm asking, I'm, or, I'm asking about when you say something is knitable, right? Yes. Um, and you get some pattern. So those cow those cow hitch stitches, mm -hmm. can you make the cow hitch stitches be be uh, be along the course instead of being along the the the, the whale? Um, I think the answer to that is no. Okay, so so, so there so there is a the course and whale create canonical directions like those are directions that that's how I pick the orientation for what I call a swatch, and at the end of the day when I'm going back to prove that, or I guess when Shashank is going back to prove that that in fact all all of these stitches are. Uh, create ribbon knots, there's a procedure of Dane filling you have to do and you only get like you have to do that Dane filling with respect to the axes that you've picked. You don't get a choice there. Understood. Okay, cool. Thank you. O other questions? Eleni, Eleni question. raised her hand. Yes, I have a quick, uh, quick, uh, a quick question before I ask my question. It was a fantastic talk. Thank you so much. <laughs> uh, so my question has to do with, uh, I don't know what I would call it, robustness, right? This is a, just a single thread going back and forth. So if somebody were, were to take uh, scissors and cut, uh, cut it uh, mm -hmm. at one spot, uh, the whole thing becomes undone. So are there, how are you thinking about making this more uh, robust? And I know in the mechanical aspects that you talked, one could talk about it just staying uh, knitted and not becoming undone just because of forces, right? But are there any other, what, what can you do to keep it together if it's cut? Yeah, so that's a really interesting question. So the way we've set up the swatch definition, if you cut, something you can basically like deconnect, like disconnect it into two, like, so it's no longer like on a torus, it's an annulus. Um, and you can sort of do that multiple times. So you have more annuli because you're basically only cutting a single one of those longitudes. Um, but you can't, you can't undo the whole thing that way. The, 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 the whole like, you, like undoing a sweater thing Mechanically, it's really, it's kind of an interesting question because often it has to do with, is it something you can locally undo or is it something that you have to take an end and pull the end through um, to make it um, undone? So there's, I guess the example that I usually use is, I don't know if you remember that company, American Apparel from like the early 2000s that had really like cheap quality, like, teeny bopper clothes, um, a lot of their clothes, they would never bother to hem. They would just cut it off as a raw hem. So you would think that anything you get loose there would just completely unravel their clothes, but actually it's reasonably mechanically stable because just generically cutting things is not going to put it in a place where everything can locally be undone. You really have to take go a long distance to pull like an entire large piece out before you can get there. And you have to do that like at multiple places. Um, so it turns out that those are pretty robust. The thing that's really not robust are runs and stockings. So runs and stockings are basically losing 
one, it doesn't spread laterally, but the locally undoing it is just, there's a ladder of loops through loops and it just undoes the whole ladder. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's another thing that, um, that's, that's a much harder thing to make robust. Thank you. There's another Go question. Ahead, yeah, hi, this is uh, yeah, Dave Green from Drexel. Great talk, but really looking forward to learning more about, about uh, especially your simulations. So I was just going to ask you about just, could you talk a little bit about how you go from the yarn level model to the macroscopic um, elastic properties for a whole swatch made of different stitches? Just how, how, yeah, how just this, at a high level, sort of how do you do that computation, those, get those, what appear to be stress strain curves? Yeah, so, so at Right now, this is a model that's pretty similar to the way a lot of sort of polymer science models works. So they look kind of at um, local interactions and then basically assume that they're all the same everywhere and then integrate across the system. So in our case, so we've basically done the same model. We say like, okay, well, there's certain costs like you when you try to make this longer than that then it has to diverge this way so we put in a constraint that, that measures that the right divergence um and then there's always a linear piece so it's basically this sort of we're basically just expanding about the you know the the, the soft directions like the linear direction and then there's an expansion about the 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 divergence um and we've basically just taken the first order of each of those and added them together um, so that's the, the really high level thing. There's microscopic, um, there's a, a sort of microscopic justification that comes from when you do this on Elastica, um, you can basically work out what happens for individual pieces under certain constraints and then try to scale that up based on um, basically uh, looking at sort of some some dimensional analyses, pretty much, um, you keep the same functional form, and then you sort of do dimensional analysis for for each of the the rest of the parts. Um, we really want to be able to make this a proper microscopic model. So everything now we've got like a lot of fitting parameters. I think we've got like for each of them. I think we've got like a fitting parameter for the linear piece and then two fitting parameters for each of the divergent pieces. Um, they do it self-consistently so that the stretching in the X direction and stretching in the Y direction have to have the same fits for both the X response and Y response. Um, so that's one step in the right direction, but it's not a proper microscopic model. We don't really know how the yarn elasticity affects these. We don't know how the shape of stitches affects these. It's really, um, it's sort of an empirical model right now. Um, so in some senses, it's, you know, just expanding about the two places, you know, there's going to be stuff. And if you fit it with a high enough order polynomial, you'll get something that looks nice. Um, but we'd really like to know in depth, like actually what's going on. Okay, um, Shiyu has a question, go ahead. Uh, hi, thanks for the wonderful talk, it's really interesting. Um, I have a question that I'm not sure is proper to ask, but uh, like, uh, do you consider, we know that when we wash the sweater, the yarn will shrink. So will the different uh, topology change how much it shrinks? Oh, that's interesting. We have not thought about that. Um, so this is, so I can tell you a little bit about the microscopics of what happens when it shrinks. Um, yeah, like it's it a little harder. The friction, right? Yeah, so, so, so what happens, it, so some things shrink and some things don't shrink. Um, so the things that, mm -hmm. um, it's like a polyester sweater isn't gonna shrink, but a wool sweater is. Mm -hmm. And so what happens is that in like mammalian hair, or fur fibers, um, they have these like little barbs on them. It's like if you like pull.
pull your hair like the wrong direction, it gets like, it's like really sticky all of a sudden, but if you pull it this way, it's soft. So what's going on is there's these little teeny microscopic barbs on your, on your hair that kind of come out and they can entangle with each other. So when you are washing it, you're sort of agitating it and basically you get a barb from one part of the fabric that like catches with a barb on another part of the fabric that kind of like pulls these bits together. Um, so you have to have this like, so you, it has to be like hot water like releases those barbs. And then all of the agitation of it means that you get this sort of like inelastic process where like the pieces of the material that aren't necessarily right next to each other when it's flat come into contact and they can touch. And that's how it like shrinks, like those touch and then these touch and then it just starts like pulling pieces that are not next to each other together. Um, so I think, I think that's such a, it's a really, really interesting question. I have not thought about how this yarn scale level understanding works with that. Um, I think it, it's, it's really, it's a great question because a lot of people do, do different types of, I guess in the yarn industry, they call that felting. Um, there's like different types of it. There's like needle felting and then felting from sweaters and you might want it shaped and you might not. And so I think from an industrial point of view, that's really, really an interesting question. I honestly don't know all of the ways that they use it to even begin to start answering that, but it's a great, it's a really great question. I had, I actually hadn't thought of that one. Thank you. Yeah, no, I, I, so right, you might say, in particular, if you want something to shrink, you might want it to shrink isotropically, right? Mm -hmm. You might not want it to shrink in, you know, so that all you have to do is stretch it back out. You want your socks to stretch, you know, isotropically. So you just have to pull your, pull them harder over your feet instead of just getting long and skinny. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, usually you find, yeah, usually you do find that they shrink more, it gets shorter um, rather than fat, than like laterally shrinking. Um, exactly, kind of exactly, yeah. So, yeah, I wonder if that has to do with like when these types of stitches are agitated, if they tend to deform in like one way versus the other way more easily. Mm -hmm. So that means that those would interlock, like the, those directions might get like more easily interlocked. Mm -hmm. That's really That's interesting. Cool. That's so cool. Great question. Other questions? Well, if not, let's thank Sabetta again.